welcome to our second day of the AJC Global Forum. I'm Abby Elbaum, and as both a member of AJC's National Leadership Council and a board member of Temple Emanuel, I'm especially honored to be here this morning. AJC and Temple Emanuel are two of the great American Jewish institutions, not only of our past and present, but also of our future. I am incredibly proud to be involved with both AJC and Temple Emanuel, continuing the legacy of my grandparents, Seymour and Vivian Milstein. My grandparents understood the significance of both institutions, finding a community and spiritual home here at Emanuel and at AJC by being deeply committed to its critical global advocacy work. My grandmother Vivian was particularly involved with AJC, having served on the Women's Leadership Board for decades and encouraging others in my family to follow in her footsteps by educating us about AJC's impactful work and inspiring our involvement. As I stand here today and look out at all of you, I am struck by how special it is that these two American Jewish giants have joined together allowing all of us to reunite and advocate for a better future for the Jewish people, the state of Israel, and truly the entire world. I can't think of anything more Jewish than that, and I can't think of a more important time to be doing this work. Today, I have the honor of introducing AGC's friend, the Honorable Anthony Blinken, the 71st Secretary of State of the United States. From his first days as Joe Biden's chief foreign policy advisor on through his tenure as President Biden's Secretary of State, Blinken has time and again demonstrated his commitment to upholding the values AJC defends every day. By word and deed, he has set the tone for the administration's fight against global anti-Semitism, has stressed the importance of the US-Israel alliance encouraged a deepening and widening of the Abraham Accords normalization and championed universal human rights. He has also strengthened American, America's resolve and solidarity with our longtime strategic partners in confronting Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Secretary Blinken is no stranger to AJC. He has appeared on our Global Forum stage twice before in 2020 and 2015. Without further ado, Secretary Blinken. Oh, I'm delighted to join the American Jewish Committee's annual Global Forum once again. I just wish I could be with you all in person. But I need that time. For more than a century, AJC has been at the forefront of the fight against anti-Semitism and for democracy. You've also been a champion for Jewish people and for the security of the state of Israel. Today, those missions are as important as ever, and they align with many of the United States' top foreign policy priorities, two of which I'd like to focus on today. First, the United States is committed to working by your side to tackle the alarming rise in anti-Semitism around the world. As this gathering knows well, our own country is not immune. Last year, the United States saw a record number of anti-Semitic incidents. That's deeply troubling in its own right. We know the pain caused by these incidents is profound, and it's felt far beyond the immediate victims. It's also alarming because history has shown that hatred of Jews often goes hand in hand with hatred of other groups, refugees, people of color, people with disabilities. And in places where anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial spread, repression and democratic backsliding are often not far behind. That's why AJC's commitment to fight all forms of religious intolerance is so critical. And it's why this administration has made combating anti-Semitism and bigotry of all kinds a top priority for our domestic and our foreign policy. It's also why we're so grateful for AJC's leadership in standing up for democracy and human rights around the globe, as we see in the recent solidarity with and support for the people of Ukraine as they defend their nation against the Russian government's brutal war of aggression. AJC is not a newcomer to this. In 1991, AJC was the first Jewish organization outside Ukraine to call on President George H.W. Bush to recognize the country's independence. It's been a staunch supporter of a free and democratic Ukraine ever since. 
Recently, the Senate confirmed Deborah Lipstadt as our special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. As I think so many of you know, Deborah has dedicated much of her life to understanding and tackling this scourge. As she often points out, what's so worrisome is not just the current surge in anti-Semitism, but also the fact that so many people, organizations, even governments, do not take it seriously enough. At this forum, you've already heard about the critically important work that Deborah and her team are doing to press others to treat this problem with the seriousness it deserves. But combating anti-Semitism abroad isn't just the special envoy's job. It's the job of the entire State Department, and one that we, and I, take very seriously. Second, the United States' commitment to Israel's security remains ironclad. We're determined that Iran will never acquire a nuclear weapon, and we're continuing our close coordination with our Israeli partners to prevent Iran from developing one. We're working tirelessly to expand normalization with Israel's neighbors through the Abraham Accords. In March, I had the chance to participate in the historic Negev summit, sitting around the same table with my colleagues from Israel, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and Morocco, as well as Egypt. This was only the latest example of how once impossible things have become possible. That includes Morocco and Israel agreeing to open embassies in Rabat and Tel Aviv, Prime Minister Bennett becoming the first Israeli Prime Minister to visit Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, Israel and Bahrain signing over a dozen agreements to deepen economic ties, a Holocaust memorial exhibit opening in Dubai. These are just a few of the ways normalization is becoming the new normal in the region. Across these efforts, we're working to forge tangible improvements in the lives of Palestinians, calm tensions, and preserve our long-standing goal of reaching a negotiated two-state solution. At the summit, we committed to maintaining the momentum of the Abraham Accords, and we've done that. To give just one example, the United States, Israel, and the UAE recently held the inaugural meeting of the Trilateral Religious Coexistence Working Group, which will bring together governments and religious figures from across the region to counter intolerance and hatred, including anti-Semitism. Now, if this sounds like the work of AJC, that's not a coincidence. Fostering these kinds of ties has been one of AJC's goals for decades, and it's progressed in no small part thanks to the purposeful leadership of AJC's CEO, David Harris. David, your dedication, your leadership, has been indispensable to this institution, to its relationship with countless administrations, to Jewish communities worldwide for the last three decades. I have benefited directly from your ideas, your counsel, your support. Your service is the embodiment of tikkun olam. To Ted Deutsch, my friend, a warm welcome and I wish you the best of luck in filling David's rather large shoes. So, I'd like to thank AJC for its enduring partnership, for its ongoing work, and for all I know that we'll continue to do together. Thank you very much. As we convene here for this plenary discussion with three of the top global affairs analysts in the world, the threats to the post-war liberal international order rage around us. Thus, the stakes and how the United States, as the world's most powerful nation and the leader of the free world, as well as our key allies in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, how we address those threats, the stakes couldn't be higher. From confronting the brazen and barbaric Russian invasion of Ukraine Moscow's repeated threats to the Western alliance, to grappling with China's rising political, diplomatic, and military muscle, from dealing with Iran's nuclear and regional ambitions, to the challenges posed by Turkey's unreliable behavior despite its NATO membership, and from defending democratic values abroad while confronting deep social divisions in countries like our own. The issues are many, they are simultaneous, and they are all important. To help us better understand this era and how best to respond to it, both in the short and long term, 
we are very fortunate to have with us today three leading observers of world affairs. First, Walter Russell Mead, who is the Ravenel B. Curry III Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship at the Hudson Institute, and a regular columnist whom we all read in the Wall Street Journal. Richard Haas is the President of the Council on Foreign Relations and has served in multiple U.S. administrations as a top foreign policy specialist. And Constanza Stelzenmuller, the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations at the Brookings Institution. She is an expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign and security policy. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel to the stage. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, let me start by talking about and asking you to talk about the trilateral relationship between the United States, Russia, and Ukraine. Yesterday, we saw in this room a, a rousing and inspiring video address from President Zelensky. David Harris has aptly described President Zelensky as the Churchill of our times, meaning a leader with vision, courage, the leadership skills to motivate a country. So if Zelensky is really the Churchill of today, what does that mean for America and America's role in the world? We have frequently spoken of America as the indispensable world leaders. In recent years, pre the invasion, we've seen numerous challenges to US leadership in the world. The fraying of NATO under President Trump, the retreat from Asia, cancellation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the withdrawal from Afghanistan under President Biden. Richard, let me start with you and ask you to address the question, where is America's leadership today? Has President Biden, through his actions over the last several months, been able to reinvigorate and reassert American leadership? First of all, it's good, good to be here and to celebrate uh, what David Harris has done uh, with this organization. And, uh, He's been a model for those of us who also work in the nonprofit field. Uh, David's just been a, a great friend and again, uh, something of an inspiration. So I just wanted to start with that. Thank you. Before I turn to the politics at hand. Look, the president is fond of saying America is back and to some extent, but also not quite. I think what we've done in uh, Ukraine is for the most part impressive. Uh, he and the administration get high marks for the reinvigoration of the Atlantic Alliance. Uh, I think the president made the, the right strategic decision about how to defend uh, important interests at the same time, not risking a direct confrontation with, with, with Russia. I think he's threaded the needle uh, fairly well. Uh, so I think, I think that's good, but that's not the totality of America's role in the world. Obviously, we are weakened by what's going on at home. We're meeting here this morning. Well, at the same time, the January 6 hearings are going on. And it's very hard to be a leading uh, country in the world, much less a spokesman for democracy, if we're so divided at home, and if we have a political system or a society that few will want to emulate. So that clearly holds us, uh, that clearly holds us uh, back. We tend not to think of domestic politics or even our economy as national security issues, but guess what they are. Uh, so there, that, you mentioned Afghanistan. I think we were wrong in what we decided and how we, how we carried it out. You mentioned our moving away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In some ways, we, we've taken one of the basic legs of American foreign policy, the big aspects of the international economic leg, and we've, we've taken it away, so we're, we're weakening ourselves there. A lot of people think they're very tough on China. Well, it's very tough to be tough on China if the United States not in, is not involved in Indo-Pacific economic uh, relations. Uh, so, but you know, we go around the world and we don't have the time for that. I'd simply say it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. And I don't think what we have at the moment though is consensus in this country 
about the scale of our role in the world. We still see fundamental debates about how much foreign policy to have. We don't have consensus about the uh, priorities for American foreign policy. We don't have, certainly don't have consensus about the use of uh, military force. So yes, I think uh, there are, again, the Ukraine thing is for the most part, we've gotten it, uh, the, we've gotten it right. But I don't think one can say because of that, we've got it right across the board. Unfortunately, we, uh, we have not. So let me, let me flip to the, perhaps the other side of the foreign policy equation. The, the Washington Post had an interesting commentary this morning. They described Putin's motivations, quote, as a narrative of mythic, mythic destiny that supersedes any geopolitical imperative in which has sent Russia on a collision course with the West. Walter, let me, let me turn to you. Do you think we have learned anything, or is this just obvious in terms of Putin's intentions? Have we learned anything that's new and different post-February of this year? I think if people hadn't noticed before the kind of leader Putin was, he's made it harder to ignore. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Putin, I think, you know, uh, Putin attacked Georgia in 2008. At that time, he was very cautious. Um, he waited until the U.S. was in the middle of a contentious election. President Bush was low in the polls. We had a major financial crisis, and he struck, and we essentially did nothing. Um, 2000, uh, you know, then, then the next time he went for Crimea and Donbass on a larger scale, and while this time the response was bigger, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't serious. Um, and so Putin has kind of feels that, that he has read the West. That's what he thought before February 24th. And I think he may not be completely disillusioned yet. Um, but yes, the idea of restoring greater Russia of reincorporating in some form Ukraine and Belarus and other ex-Soviet territories to the east. Russian intervention was decisive in a recent crisis in Kazakhstan. Um, he has been moving out. And yeah, I, I don't think we should be very surprised that, that that's what he's about. As we were speaking before the panel, uh, famous Russian historian Richard Pipes has written for years that there's nothing new under the sun with Russia, that it's an imperialistic, uh, protectionistic regime, and this is all imminently predictable. Well, the, one of the most discouraging things if you write about American foreign policy is that George Kennan's essay uh, on you know, the, the, the Foreign Affairs X article, uh, basically George Kennan's core point was our problem with these people is not that they are Marxist, it is that they are Russian. And <laughs> Uh, actually went into a whole argument based on Russian history and culture about both Russian ambitions and a clash between Russian and American understandings of how the world works. It was sort of depressing to see at the end of the Cold War, but he says he was the author of containment. He was a genius. Boy, that Kennan saw it all coming. And now that they're not communist, it will be easy to be friends with the Russians. So you can write the most influential article in the history of American foreign policy and find the entire American political establishment get you completely wrong, even as they hail your genius. This is really discouraging, let me tell you. <laughs> but at least he published it in Foreign Affairs. <laughs> And you can still get it in the archives. Um, Constanza, let me ask you in terms of what have we learned, what, what, what can we conclude, what should we conclude, both Germany and the United States, about Putin's difficulties in asserting military power? Obviously, the campaign has not gone the way he expected it to go, Putin. On the other hand, recent... Uh, Recent information makes it sound like he may be achieving what his objective was in the East. What, what should we take away from this experience? Well, first off, I want to say also thank you for inviting me here. And I think for me, the situation is a little different than for Walter and for Richard. I'm a 
German, a Protestant, and the daughter of war children, and I think my parents would have been very moved if they were still alive to find me invited to this panel. So thank you very much for that, too. Um, on Russia, I am in the pessimistic camp, both on Putin's goals, and while I, am, I think we must acknowledge that his military capabilities have been shown to be weaker, his tactics to be weaker, um, I think he has one advantage that the West does not have and that Ukraine does not have, which is that for him there are no limits. There are no limits on how he treats his soldiers, many of whom are from ethnic minorities in the far east of Russia who were tricked into this campaign, who are being brutally sacrificed to these imperialist goals. He is pounding Ukrainian infrastructure into the dust. He's obliterating cities, human habitation and, and infrastructure and he's killing civilians recklessly in ways that obviously invite comparison with the Nazis in the 1930s, the, the, third, the Second World War, and, and Hitler's campaigns of extermination. Um, it's hard for me to say that because uh, these comparisons, for all the obvious and, and correct reasons in Germany, are, are fraught with, with moral danger and, and with factual danger. But I think it's necessary to say at this point that we haven't seen anything like this since then. And I think that that has consequences for the way we should rally against it. So let me follow up on that. If it is as relentless, as focused, as amoral as you are suggesting, and the evidence is overwhelming that it is, has the West properly calibrated its response. We're looking at gas prices in the United States that are approaching $6 a gallon. Are we really willing to take the steps necessary to impose even more stringent sanctions? Well, I think the, the evidence on that is mixed. Um, I'm going to say, and I said last week in testimony and before the Helsinki Commission, that I think that there are many honorable reasons for the very carefully calibrated response by the Biden administration together with its European allies. Yeah. And I think, again, it comes back to what the obligations that Western governments feel towards their citizens and their voters which is to attempt to balance the cost and the benefit of their policies and to not have the cost exceed the benefit. Right? And so a lot of, these, of, of this very careful response, uh, the ultimate goal of which is to signal to Moscow every day, we do not want to be parties in this war. We are supporting Ukraine for moral reasons and for reasons of interest, but we will not engage on our own against you. Um, I, I think that's honorable, but possibly ultimately doomed. Uh, doomed to failure, I mean. Doomed to failure because I think that Putin is on an escalatory downward course that somewhat resembles an avalanche. I'm not sure that he could stop himself if he wanted to. I, I think that there is an inherent logic to his actions that I think will not allow a reprieve of pause of sin sincere negotiations. I think it would be literally a death sentence for him if he retreated. And that, therefore, escalation dominance is in his hands. And I think the only thing that we can do at this point, the only thing, literally, is to raise the cost of his actions in such a way as to make his inner circle rethink the cost of continuing to support him. That's so, the only thing I can see. So did, Richard, let me ask you, did, did the president wittingly or unwittingly take an important negotiating tool off the table by saying proactively and preemptively he will never send American troops? I don't think so. I think what he did was correct, and in part it gets to something about Mr. Putin. He is uh, in many ways unconstrained. I can't see 
the face is too clearly in this room, but those of you who are of my generation will obviously recall the Cuban Missile Crisis. I would simply say Nikita Khrushchev acted with far greater collective leadership and institutional constraint than Vladimir Putin does now. Vladimir Putin has systematically deinstitutionalized government in Russia. Yeah. And I think we have to act carefully. So that's why I think the indirect approach, rather than have the United States put troops on the ground or planes in the air, I think is, is right. Uh, I don't think Mr. Putin, by the way, is, is going to uh, escalate against NATO. If he can't defeat Ukraine handily, he knows what would happen if he took on, on NATO. He knows he can't lose, I agree, agree 100%. What's not clear to me what his definition of a win? enough or uh, a non-loss, even if it's, uh, and you know, we may find out, but I think, uh, but I think we need to act with a, a degree of restraint simply because we cannot count on him. But that doesn't mean that we have, we also have to give Ukraine the means it needs. And I would say if there's a criticism of what we're doing, I'd say two criticisms. One is there's probably more we can and should be providing Ukraine in the way of conventional armaments. And the biggest weakness, and I agree 100% with what Constanza said, the biggest weakness right now is the West is still funding Mr. Putin's war effort. The idea that hundreds of millions of dollars are going into Russia every day from Western Europe for purchases of Russian gas is an outrage. Is an outrage. Uh, and, you know, so my view would take the economic contraction, shut it down, at least put tariffs on Russian gas exports to reduce demand for them. Are we doing everything possible we can to accelerate the transition from a gas dependent Europe, Russian gas dependent Europe, to other sources of gas or to other energy supplies? I don't think so. So there is more we can and should be doing to cease funding the war effort that is doing exactly the sort of uh, destructiveness we're seeing. Uh, in, in the words of a prior administration, let me pivot to Asia. Um, Secretary Blinken, in a speech given two or three months after the start of the invasion of Ukraine, described China as the most serious challenge to the international order and a test for U.S. diplomacy. So even in the face of Ukraine, Secretary Blinken in the Biden administration said, pay attention to China. This is the whole game. Um, I want to, Walter, pivot to you, pointing to a couple of, of recent events, which in isolation may not mean anything, but we may look back on this as, boy, this sure looked like 1935 in in Asia when we weren't paying attention to what Japan was, was doing. Uh, I point to the foreign minister of China's recent trip through the Pacific Islands and the recent agreement or treaty signed with the Solomon Islands in which for the first time China said they would come to the military defense of the Solomon Islands, a historic US ally. Um, the launching of a third aircraft carrier by the Chinese military which tend not to be assertions of peaceful military force, uh, reports that China has entered into an agreement of some sort with Cambodia to open a mutual naval base in Cambodia. And this is all on the heels of uh, port agreements in the Middle East and, and in Africa. Are we paying attention? Are we on top of this? Do we see what's coming? It is uh, interesting. We've been talking about the pivot to Asia for a long time. Uh, I've just come back from a week in India, a week in Indonesia. People there don't actually seem to think we've done a lot of pivoting. Um, we do a lot of talking. I think when historians come back to look at the last 15 years of American policy in Asia, they'll notice that in, say, 2008 or so, American military superiority in the Western Pacific was so high that there was really no prospect of China invading Taiwan, the mainland invading Taiwan. 
Uh, today, we, we hear of war games in which, in fact, the Chinese succeed. Um, there was not a big debate in the United States in those years, not a big public debate, not an awareness. We are letting the military balance slip away in a way that is profoundly destabilizing. We had, just as, as we were failing to counter Russian moves in, uh, the, in, in the Caucasus, the Donbass, and Crimea, uh, China built those islands in the South Pacific, said, oh, we won't use them, we won't militarize them, militarize them, and we essentially did zero. In fact, we continued to watch the military balance tip in China's direction. It's not surprising to me that Putin should have thought that uh, the West was, was no longer the force that it had once been. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's not a surprise that people both in Asia and in, in Moscow were smelling weakness. Um, we haven't really seen, I think, anything like a sufficient awareness in, in this country of how far things have slid. You know, we're not at the precipice yet, but um, uh, we, the, the margin of safety is significantly narrower than it was a decade ago or 15 years ago. Um, we will need to do foreign policy differently if we go anywhere. And if we're going to succeed, and let me just add too that that when I talk to people uh, in Asia or, or in Europe, for that matter, uh, what they what they often say is, "Look, you people elected George W. Bush, and you had one kind of foreign policy. Then you elected Barack Obama. You had a completely different kind of foreign policy. You elected Donald Trump, and you went off in yet another direction. Now you've elected Joe Biden, and you're doing this, but." We don't think you know what you'll be doing in one, two, or three years. We cannot count on anything you say. All right? That is a tremendously destabilizing condition. When neither our adversaries, nor our allies, nor neutrals believe what the President of the United States says or believes that the United States has a steadfast view and will continue to operate. So this American weakness, which is not a weakness of the Biden administration, Trump administration, or the Obama administration, but an underlying weakness in, in our national strategy, in, our, in our, our national consciousness, one could say, is maybe the single most destabilizing factor in world politics. And if you look at the Biden administration polling, I think today he's under 40% in the, in the average. There are a lot of people out there thinking, well, after the midterms, it's gonna be a completely different picture in the US. And in 2024, we might have Donald Trump back. So let me, do let me double down on the, on the point that you just made, because you were, I think, making the point that there's been an inconsistency, maybe even an incoherence over the structure of the last several administrations. Um, I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but we're going to engage in a test of your memories and acumen. One of you, one of you wrote this. <laughs> oh, now, this, this it, was, is, it was Costanza. <laughs> It's, not a, it's actually not a gotcha. It's, you looked very prescient. But you get extra points if you remember writing it. <laughs> One of you wrote, shortcomings here at home, speaking about the United States, directly threaten America's ability to project power and exert influence overseas to compete in the global marketplace, to generate the resources needed to promote the full range of US interest abroad, and to set a compelling example that will influence the thinking and behavior of others. As a result, the ability of the United States I to act and lead in the world is diminishing. Clue, you wrote it nine years ago, before the Trump administration, at the beginning of the Obama administration. <laughs> Bingo, you win. Foreign policy begins at home. <laughs>
True. Look, it was true then. What Walter said was exactly right. I, I, I see a lot of people because of my job. I'm, I'm as president of the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, we were talking about it beforehand. I don't have deal flow like all you people in the financial world. I have people flow and idea flow. And the most common question I get asked, and it's a version of Walter's riff, is what's the aberration and what's the norm? You all, we, we just experienced four years of Donald Trump. Before that, we had Barack Obama. We had the war in Iraq. Now we have Joe Biden. What comes in the future? Is Biden the, the aberration and Trump represents the new norm? Or is Trump a four-year aberration and now we're back to something else? And the, so we have tremendous uncertainty as to what we stand for. To use a sport, it's analogy. Foreign policy used to take place within the 40 yard lines. Increasingly, it's, we've brought it to the end zones. And that's a very, very different American foreign policy. And then, think about American society. The other question I get asked the most, What's going on with you all? Guns, opioids, you had an excess of supply of vaccine, the rest of the world had an excess of demand. January 6th. January 6th, and people go and they say, what happened to the United States I knew, the one I studied in 20 or 30 years ago? Because so many elites around the world had the opportunity to come here and do their undergraduate or, or graduate uh, work. So again, I. You know, I know we're going to be talking about Walter's book in a second, but I, authors can't help but refer to their own. <laughs> I give talks all the time, and I thought, I'm always asked, what's the biggest threat? Is it Russia? That's where we began. Is it China? Is it Iran? Is it North Korea? Is it terrorism? Is it climate change? And the answer is, these are all enormous threats. The biggest, threats to America, the biggest threat to American national security is America. We have become our own biggest threat. And, I'm writing a book what, about democracy and about whether we can save our democracy and continue to function as a coherent, cohesive society. And for the first time in my life, I can't answer that question with confidence. And that to me is that we've, we've arrived at a really perilous point, not just out there, but here. Costanza, let me give you the, the, the last word as our, as our guest. Um, Chancellor Scholz recently referred to Ukraine and German foreign policy as Zeitenwende. That that we are at a watershed. A watershed. A, watershed, a, watershed. a, a turning a turning point in and and we can see it happening in the the, the funding of, of uh, Ukrainian transfer of arms to Ukraine, the reinvigoration of, of German spending on on the military, at least talk about re reconfiguring energy dependence on Russia. Maybe it's just talk so far. Um, is that the point that, that Richard's making, that Germany, Japan, perhaps Israel, can no longer count on the United States? And can we rehabilitate that? Okay, wow, that was a really complicated question. Um, let me start by saying I, I once wrote a German constitutional law PhD on direct democracy in America. So, um, and, and my dad, well, I, I called my dad a war child. He was actually a, a juvenile POW um, and American POW because he swam the Elbe to escape the Russians in February uh, 45 um, in, uh, near Dresden. And my dad used to say to me, we can trust the Americans and the Brits never to do the kind of horrific things that we did. And few things to me are as painful and as scary as watching um, people applaud actual fascism here in America, a homegrown fascism in America. That to me is in, just was always inconceivable. I have a, just a huge admiration for the American constitutional tradition. And to me, this is profoundly un-American. And, and I hope that this country manages to deal with this temptation and with its issues. But I do also want to say, you know, um, I appreciate uh, Waters and Richard's sort of self-criticism, but I do want, also want to say that we as Europeans need to carry a greater burden. I think that what the Germans are doing right now and the Europeans are doing right now is actually historical. And I think they're going to go on doing it simply because Putin is not going to stop. We're going to be forced, more, much more will be asked of us. 
I, when I watch what we're doing it and how we're doing it, when I watch Schultz communicating or rather not communicating, I'm often frustrated, sometimes ashamed. I think we're taking too long to uncouple from Russian gas. We're taking too long to deliver, deliver heavy, heavy weapons to Ukraine. All of that guilty as charged. At the same time, uh, I, I am seeing a shift. And I want to say one thing to you, since you very kindly gave me the last word. I think that we are now in a transatlantic relationship that is fundamentally changed. We do understand the peril that we're in, in Europe, and the Germans understand it. I am utterly convinced of that. It's the loudest idiots who don't, but I wouldn't take them that seriously. But um, I will also say to you that I think that we are now dependent on each other in ways that we used not to be, as Americans and Europeans, in a time when we are seeing our adversaries weaponize economic interdependence against us. European regulatory power and economic power uh, and its single markets are actually force multipliers for America. I think that the sanctions that we've promulgated against Russia, which are massive, would not have been this impactful had it not been for uh, the Biden administration's em embrace of Europe. And we, I hope we continue to keep that in mind. I don't think we can handle the Chinese as adversaries or the Russians as adversaries if we allow ourselves to be divided. And so my greatest hope for the future is that we manage to stick this through together. Oh. Also. Well, I promised I was going to give you the last word, but I'm a lawyer and I can't resist. <laughs> of course not. Um, we come as members of AJC to Global Forum, um, not for happy talk. I mean, there's obviously a fair amount of happy talk in our presentations, um, and, and that's good. But I think this has been a wonderful conversation and a, and a sobering conversation. David likes to make the point that we may be entering a post-Cold post War world, two, two posts. We may be looking at a change in the international order, whether it's because of energy, whether it's because of the rise of China, whether it's because of our perhaps failure to, to respond appropriately to the threat from Putin. Um, we are truly at an inflection point and I hope you will agree with me that our panel has been clear-eyed and, and sober and enlightening. And please join me in thanking them for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Well done. It is no secret that AJC has, for decades, been sounding the alarm against the multitude of threats posed by the Iranian regime's destructive and destabilizing role in the world. That includes repeated calls for the annihilation of Israel, support for terrorist organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah, pursuit of nuclear weapons, expansionist interference in the internal affairs of other countries, dissemination of anti-Semitism, and of course, pervasive human rights abuses. Our next speaker, recipient of this year's AJC Moral Courage Award, has dedicated her life to exposing the abuses of the Iranian regime, risking her life in the process to shed light on those human rights abuses and advocate for the Iranian women who are fighting bravely for a better future. Described by the New York Times as the woman whose hair frightens Iran, Masi Alinejad is a journalist, author, and women's rights campaigner and one of the most prominent and vocal opposition figures challenging the Iranian regime. Born and raised in northern Iran, Masi started her career as a parliamentary journalist in Tehran, where she drew controversy for her articles on corrupt lawmakers. In 2009, she was forced to leave Iran after the crackdown on protests against the disputed presidential elections. In 2014, she founded a campaign against the compulsory hijab which became the largest civil disobedience campaign in the country's history. And just last year, Masi was the target of an Iranian kidnapping plot, 
as Iranian intelligence agents spied on her New York City home and tried to pay her family to lure her out of the country. But she hasn't given up, she hasn't cowered, and she continues to fight for her beliefs. We have the distinct honor today of hearing her story firsthand and experiencing up close what true courage looks like. Please join me in welcoming Masi Alinejad. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's an honor being on this stage among those distinguished leaders from Ukraine, President Zelensky, the hero of old democracy fighters, Secretary Blinken. Secretary Blinken, if you're still hearing me, I was going to ask you not go easy on Islamic Republic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank, huge thank, to American Jewish Committee for inviting me. How ironic, I'm coming from a country where the regime hates America. The regime hates the state of Israel. Guess what? The same regime hates me, free women. Millions of free women who are fighting against religious dictatorship. So I'm honored to be here and ask you, when we have common enemy, what can we do? We have to be united as well. We need a united Middle East. We need a united Middle East against religious dictatorship. We need a democratic Middle East where women and men are equal. That is why I'm here. Today, I'm here to tell you that have you ever seen angry crowd of Iranians on your TV saying death to Israel, death to America? Yes or not? Yes. I'm here to tell you a different story. I am one of them. I grew up in a tiny village watching all the clerics and mullahs through my TV, black and white TV. They were brainwash us. My generation were told that you have to say death to America, death to Israel, as loud as the people in White House hear your voice. I was told that your death to Israel chants will shake the Tel Aviv. But these days, there were massive protests in Iran. Iranians are risking their lives. They get guns and bullets. But all you hear, no single chance against Israel or America. Still, against Russia, China dictators, against all the dictators, Hamas, Hezbollah, against the Islamic Republic. And that gives you a message that you have to support those people who want to have peace with democratic countries. You have to stick with the people of Iran who are actually risking their lives and saying that we are your friends. And I want... <laughs> and there is a specific, specific protest that I want to mention. In three days, November, bloody November, the Iranian regime killed 1,500 people in the streets. They shut down the internet. They killed people. The main slogan was that. Death to Islamic Republic. They were asking America, the Europe, democratic country, to support them. 1,500 people got killed, and now the mothers for justice, their mothers calling on the free world that look, when you ignored the Russian activists calling you to isolate Putin, what happened? Now war is here. If you ignore the chant of Iranian people, then you have to face Islamic ideology, Islamic dictators here in Europe. I myself don't think that I'm safe miles away from Iran, and that's why I'm loud here. No. As far as the Islamic Republic is in power, none of you, none of you are safe. Right now that I'm talking to you, American citizen, Swedish citizen, French citizen, German citizen, British citizens, 
are in Iranian prison. They're being used like bargaining chip. And what I want you is not too much to ask. I want you to get united and ask all your leaders to ask Iranian regime first, release all the innocent political prisoners. You, all you hear in the West is just talking about nuclear deal. But believe me, Iranian people in the streets want to have democratic regime. They want to get rid of dictatorship. Whether you support them or not, one day we will get rid of the Islamic Republic, but the history will judge those countries who have stood up with the dictators rather than with people of Iran. I myself, I was the target of the Islamic Republic to break me. They did everything, everything. First, they arrested the woman who sent videos to me. 29 women got arrested only on one day. I felt guilty and miserable. But their mothers joined them. And that gave me power that these people are not going to give up. So the government didn't give up as well. They went after my family. They interrogated my 70-year-old mother, who has nothing to do with my campaign against compulsory job against Islamic Republic. That didn't stop me. They brought my sister on TV to disown me publicly. I was watching my sister 17 minutes, denouncing me. That didn't stop me. They put my brother in prison for two years. I felt miserable and guilty. But I have bigger families inside Iran whose family got killed, tortured to death, and they want me to be their voices. So putting my brother in jail didn't stop me. You remember I told you the black and white TV in my village? I was watching the mullahs. Now the mullahs are watching me. And I'm telling them. Don't get me wrong, it's not about me. When I'm saying the mullahs are watching me, it means the mullahs are watching millions of other women, other men who are using their mobile phone like their weapon. I have nine million followers on all my social media, more than the supreme leader of Iran, more than the mullahs. I'm not a model. I'm not an influencer on Instagram. I'm just echoing the true leaders within the society. I'm just echoing the voice of Iranian people. And every day when I wake up, by all the attack, harassment, I tell myself that this regime did everything to break you. Yes, they did. Sometimes they were successful. I cried. But listen, I have only two options. To feel miserable every day, or to make my oppressors feel miserable. I choose the second one. And I want you, thank you. And I want you to join me and be the voice of Iranian people who made the Islamic Republic miserable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Masi, for that very inspiring, unbelievably inspiring presentation. You've made it abundantly clear to our audience and everyone watching at home why you are so deserving of this year's prestigious Moral Courage Award. On behalf of American Jewish Committee, I'm so pleased to present you this award, which reads, AJC Moral Courage Award presented to Masi Alinejad, June 2022, New York City, for your moral, intellectual, and physical courage, extraordinary bravery, and commitment to the protection of human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I dedicated this award to the people of Iran. Don't listen to what you hear from media, listen to social media, listen to the people of Iran who are actually sacrificing their life to save the rest of the world from Islamic ideology, from Islamic religious dictatorship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing.
Congratulations. Amazing. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage Sheikh Abdullah Al Khalifa and Lilia Ritzk. This past March, the two of us joined seven other colleagues from across the Arab world to travel to an AJC Project Interchange delegation to Israel, AJC's signature educational program introducing Israel to leaders from around the world. This historic trip was the first delegation of leaders from countries that signed the Abraham Accords. Our group represented some of the best. Our group represented some of the best and brightest minds across the Arab world. A range of young practitioners in the fields of investment, law, high tech, agriculture, tourism, diplomacy, and energy. Partnership and dialogue are core values shared by AJC and think tanks such as the Policy Center for the New South, where I work in Rabat, Morocco. This alignment led to my participation in Project Interchange. We're honored to introduce the next panel, Winds of Change, the New Middle East, in which we will hear from Israeli, Moroccan, Bahraini, and Emirati ambassadors to the United Nations. But before we do, we want to explain how the Abraham Accords and Project Interchange have impacted each of us. Ever since I was in middle school, I was an early adopter of a more moderate and balanced view of the situation in Israel-Palestine. Having said that, no amount of reading or studying as a student of international relations could have prepared me for what I experienced on my first trip to Eretz Israel. The itinerary of the trip was so well-crafted and so well-delivered I cannot imagine a more fulfilling and comprehensive overview of all the facets of Israeli life, culture, politics, and history, all the while never losing sight of the very human element of that storied and ancient land. Diversity and coexistence are two concepts and experiences that are central to my Moroccan identity and also mirrored in Israeli society, especially in the city of Haifa that we were fortunate enough to visit during the program. As a Moroccan woman, the experience that stuck with me most was connecting with two artists of Jewish and Amazir Moroccan descent in their home in Jerusalem, where we spoke in our mother tongue, Moroccan derija, um, and sipped on Moroccan tea and heard about their per particular experiences in Israel. We watched poignant segments of documentaries about identity produced by one of the artists and joined in singing Moroccan and other North African songs. What I carry with me from this experience is the undeniable link between Morocco and the Jewish Moroccan population in Israel, a link that is deeply rooted in history and reflects a unique and common heritage. AJC Project Interchange provided us with an unmatched opportunity to learn more about Israel's reality and complexity. There is no substitute for first-hand experience when it comes to understanding Israel. Interactions with government officials, security authorities, business executives, interfaith leaders, policy, anal policy analysts, educators, and media professionals helped correct misunderstandings and misperceptions and encourage greater contact with Israel and the Jewish world. Our visit to Israel cannot be summarized by a single story or a takeaway, but the dynamic and personal essence of our experience demonstrates the potential of the Abraham Accords for everyday Arabs and Israelis. Extremism will forever bring hostility upon individuals instead of stability and prosperity. After too many decades without peace, the next generation of Middle East leaders now has the power to overcome the long-standing narratives that have kept our region apart. Arabs, is, Arabs and Israelis, Muslims and Jews, can finally set aside their differences and unite in their resolve to find a way forward and not allow the wars of our past determine the future of our region. It won't be easy. We face challenges ahead. Signing a piece of paper is an important step but it will only be a true peace if we prioritize people-to-people -people engagement. Through programs like Project Interchange, 
where Arabs and Israelis directly engage with one another, we are creating a new cadre of regional advocates committed to breaking down barriers and depending on one another in ways never before imaginable. We are thankful to the supporters of Project Interchange who make this possible. It is with this message in our hearts that I am honored to introduce the next panel, which will be moderated by Jason Isaacson, the AJC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer, and one of the most ardent believers in the power of Israeli-Arab engagement. Without further ado, please welcome His Excellency Omar Hillel, Ambassador of Morocco to the United Nations, Her Excellency Lana Nuseiba, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United Nations. His Excellency Gilad Erdan, Ambassador of Israel to the United Nations. And joining us virtually, His Excellency Jamal al rawai Ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United Nations. First of all, thank you again, Lilia and Sheikh Abdullah, for the perfect introduction to a four-way conversation on the meaning and the promise of expanded, normalized relations between Arab states and Israel. And, and I also wanted to, again, thank um, Ambassador al Rawai for joining us virtually um, while you're isolated because of COVID. So, <laughs> um, it is an honor for me to share a, a stage before a global audience with ambassadors of three Arab states and Israel, a configuration that was really unimaginable just two years ago. These countries, their leaders, their distinguished representatives before the United Nations are making history. They're truly making a new Middle East. AJC is proud to have contributed to this history and to keep contributing to a widening of the circle of Arab-Israeli peace through our new office in Abu Dhabi uh, and AJC Project Interchange, which you just heard described a moment ago, the work of our extremely well-connected Jerusalem office, and a range of exciting new initiatives and programming partnerships. Now we have a very limited window and a lot of ground to cover. So let me pose the ambassadors a few basic questions and ask for condensed answers. <laughs> I know it's always a challenge for us. First ambassadors, and I'll start with you, Ambassador Naseba. Uh, I have a two-part question in three minutes, of course. Please tell me how your country has adapted to this historic change, specifically how the general public and the business community and um, very significantly, your young people have responded to normalization. And second, what are the particular benefits that your country is expecting from normalization? Uh, are the primary benefits in the security dimension, increased trade and investment, the sharing of uh, technologies, uh, water resource management, um, health, energy sector, another realm? What are the benefits that you're seeing? Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for having us, myself and my colleagues here today, and I'll try and overturn the stereotype that ambassadors to the United Nations cannot give condensed answers. <laughs> so first of all, I have to start on behalf of all my colleagues in thanking David Harris for his incredible work and his contribution and the legacy he leaves behind. We look forward to working with Representative Deutsch and, of course, with Ambassador Sievers, who has just opened the first of its kind AJC office in Abu Dhabi, and we're proud to be here to announce that, too. Mm. Jason, to answer your question uh, as briefly as I can, I think the Abraham Accords have clearly been a step change for the region, a step change in the way we think and how we address problems in the region, uh, but also particularly for the UAE, the country that I represent, an amazing dynamism and productivity and diplomacy has emerged as a result of those accords that were signed. Uh, in the people-to-people -people exchanges, in the business, in the community ties, uh, $2.5 billion or thereabouts in trade already, and that's before the, fr the free trade agreement that was just signed between the UAE and Israel, where we predict and hope that in the next five years we'll see over $10 billion in trade annually. Those are big numbers. We hope to see 1,000 Israeli businesses in the UAE by the end of the year, and Israel's just announced in March that they hope to see 100,000 visitors from the UAE annually to their country. What does that mean in a people-to-people -people sense? It means that when 
Israelis, but also Jewish people from around the world come to the UAE, they will find a home there. They will identify with the religious practices, they will find synagogues, they will find kosher catering, they will find mikvahs, and they will find a tolerance and coexistence in that country that we hope can be rep replicated across the region. It is a message of hope and tolerance for that region. And I think in all the fields that you mentioned, we are accelerating our cooperation in green energy, technology, IT, uh, learning of languages, and ultimately the Abraham Accords is not just a peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. I think it's also a step change in the relationship globally between Islam and the Jewish faith. And that's really important. Yeah. That's my three minutes, I think. Excellent. You know how to do that. Ambassador Hilal, I want to ask, ask you. The same question. Yes, yes same question. First of all, let Benefits me and reaction in your country. Let me first of all say how much I'm very happy to be here and to meet uh, friends and colleagues and the Jewish community of AGC. Uh, concerning your question, I would say that uh, there was continuum. There was not a big change. Why continuum? because uh, Jewish people have been in Morocco since 3,000 years. We have been living together, Muslims and Jewish, as Moroccans, not as different communities. So, and they still remain. Continuity also because the trend of exchange of visits between the uh, Israelis originally from Morocco used to come all the time for religious uh, events, or for weddings, or for investing. This trend has been also uh, uh, all the time. What change was just we have more official uh, contact and more official uh, exchange of visit of ministers. And I'm very glad that since uh, the signature of the, the, the trilateral uh, declaration, we had more than five ministers visiting Morocco. We signed uh, 10 agreements, and the 10 agreements and memorandum of understanding are uh, tackling all kinds of the issues, uh, new technology, intelligence, defense, agriculture, education, uh, sports, uh, trade, uh, tourism. We have now more and more airlines. We have Moroccan airlines going to Morocco, uh, to Israel, and also Al Al. And uh, as everybody knows, we have the second uh, community in Israel, Moroccans, it's 900,000 people living in Israel. So this trend has been all the time there, and that's why I'm saying that uh, uh, there is not real change, but just continuum with the new momentum, with new engagements, and with new expectations and hopes. By the way, I have to point out that the first time that HAC met with His Majesty King Mohammed VI, just after he became the king of Morocco, he talked to us about his 600,000 subjects in Israel. So I, I very much identify with what you're saying. The history of the relationship is, 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 goes back centuries. May I say something on this? Uh, in the 60s, uh, a visitor came to Morocco and told him there is... Uh, some Jewish who are living to Israel, we have to, to do whatever we can to keep them here. And his answer was very clear and spontaneous. He said, no, let, let them to go. I will have them as ambassadors of Morocco <laughs> all around the world. And that's what happened because we have Moroccan Jewish all around the world. They love Morocco. They are, they are still keeping their links with uh, the, the culture, with the civilization. They are defending Morocco, and we are very grateful to them because we know that whenever we need them, they are there to help. And also, we are very happy to help them because they enrich our present as they enrich our past. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Al Rawai. There is a Jewish community in Bahrain as well. It's small and goes back 150 years or so. But talk about the benefits of normalization and the reaction of your people. Oh, uh, first of all, uh, Jason, uh, thank, thank you so much uh, uh, for the uh, 
uh, your invitation and also I want to thank the entire team of the uh, American Jewish Committee for, uh, for organizing this important forum. Uh, I'm glad to, delighted to be with uh, all my colleagues. Uh, let me start by saying that the signing of the uh, uh, Abraham Accord or the declaration in support of peace between Bahrain and Israel uh, reflects Bahrain's uh, approach under the uh, leadership of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Khalifa of uh, openness and uh, uh, communication with the countries to achieve uh, prosperity for all peoples. This approach is not new to us in Bahrain. Even before the signing of uh, the declaration, there were interaction and meetings that took place you know, most notably the Peace to Prosperity Workshop that was held in, uh, in Bahrain, which is uh, a great and an important uh, step to communicate with the, with the Jewish, with the Israeli people uh, uh, direct. We have always been committed to promoting the, uh, the values of uh, dialogue, uh, tolerance, <coughs> and, uh, and understanding. And it has been our experience for centuries having uh, multiple uh, religious uh, communities uh, living peacefully side, uh, side by side. And we will uh, continue and advance uh, this history of religious diversity and, uh, and harmony. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Adan, benefits to Israel, benefits to the region, reaction of the people of Israel. Yeah. So uh, first, Jason, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm really happy to be here on this stage with my dear colleagues. I want to wish uh, Jamal a speedy recovery uh, on behalf of all of us. And uh, let me tell you that uh, I know how, how many efforts were done by the AJC team all around the world to push uh, these normalizations, uh, accords, so I truly I'm truly grateful on behalf of the State of Israel to AJC, and you all deserve a one round of applause to yourself. So. Thank you. And of course, I want to mention my uh, dear friend, uh, David Harris, for his service, and as we used to call him, since Shimon Peres used to call him the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of the Jewish people all around the world. Thank you, David. Uh, so let, let me really describe brief, briefly, because my uh, peers, they mentioned most of the important things. I think that uh, we felt a huge change compared to the peace agreements we had in the past. Of course, the peace agreements we had with Jordan and Egypt had uh, historic importance. They were the ones who paved the way and opened the door uh, for uh, peace in our region. But they were, as we called, Cold peace, because you know we had wars, we had hostilities uh, with the UAE, with Morocco, as was mentioned, with uh, Bahrain. We never had wars. Uh, they, you know, we always allowed our people to interact with uh, with one another, even when it was under the uh, under the radar. All our countries they support a culture of peace, a culture of uh, tolerance. So the approach was a bottom-up approach. And when all the catalysts, you know, there was a convergence of catalysts that led to the signing of these accords, so immediately there was an explosion of people-to-people -people, uh, interactions. Obviously, our, our government tried and helped with facilitating and building the infra infrastructure by opening embassies, uh, visits, uh, signing uh, visa waiver programs. You know, Israelis can enter the UAE now without a visa, but they cannot enter the United States of America without a visa. <laughs> yeah. Do something about it, by the way, you hear? And, yes. uh, no, so, and we inaugurated direct uh, airlines. So immediately you could see the interactions at the height of the pandemic, hundreds of thousands of Israelis visited Morocco, UAE, uh, Bahrain, the trade, uh, the trade uh, agreement that uh, 
that was signed. So we're very optimistic, and we're, when, so, but it wasn't really essential. I mean, the people were there, they were prepared. We as government just, we needed not to, uh, not to interrupt them, to uh, get to know each other. And that's why I'm so optimistic, because this psychological shift, this mutual acceptance, in addition to the new economic prospect, and we don't need to elaborate, we see it everywhere, exploring together the space, signing uh, uh, universities that are signing uh, you know, uh, programs together, uh, Israeli farmers growing avocado in the Atlas uh, Mountains, everything, every day new, exciting stories. So now this combination of uh, psychological shift and economic, uh, economic uh, prospects, I'm sure, is going to lead this com combination to make this peace more resilient. And also, when the uh, fruits of this peace will be exposed to the Muslim world, I'm sure many more countries will follow suit, and that's why I'm so optimistic. Excellent. Ambassador. <laughs> My next question, and I'll start with you, Ambassador Erdogan. Um, as, as it has in the past. But it wasn't brief, as you... It, well, you know, we'll try. <laughs> Let's try the next time. Um, as it has in the past, the United States played a key role, of course, in advancing normalization. Yeah. Um, what role do you expect and what role do you need the United States to play to expand the circle of Arab-Israeli peace and, and, and assure that the current relationships, as you're just saying, generate the kind of success stories that will lead to this widening of the circle of peace? Yeah, so I was, I was there. I was Israel's ambassador yes. to the United States, and I was uh, privileged to be on the South Lawn at the uh, White House when the uh, signing of the Abram Accords took place. And you could feel the change in the air, but it was quite clear that, uh, again, I mentioned the convergence of a uh, few catalysts, but more than anything else, the fact that we had a very, very, many more very committed administration that conveyed a clear message. The road to Washington passes through Jerusalem. If you want to improve your relations with the American administration, you also it's better for you to uh, improve your relations with Israel as well. And they were willing to incentivize the, the all parties, also including the, the Israeli government. So it had an enormous uh, contribution to achieving these accords, and I was truly encouraged to see that uh, even though these accords were signed during Tra President Trump's tenure, uh, President Biden immediately embraced them. Yes. Uh, we, have, we established a joint team, the State Department, and with my embassy in order to try to identify new potential countries that might normalize re relations and move forward with Israel, and that's what we need also now. I mean, uh, I'm, again, encouraged to see that there is a bipartisan uh, support for the accord. By the way, I congratulate your new CEO, Theo Deutsch, and he had an enormous contribution yes. to making sure these accords uh, enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, we even uh, participated in a few uh, events in Washington to deepen the uh, implementation of the accords, and now I see the uh, new Defend, I think, Defend Act, yep. moving forward, encouraging all of us to work together to build this regional uh, missile defense uh, systems. Um, and, and now, maybe to conclude with uh, congratulating President Biden for his upcoming trip to Israel and praying and wishing that uh, his stop in Saudi Arabia would help to expand the new circle of peace because for sure if Saudi Arabia joins the uh, accords uh, with its uh, unique status of the you know the protector of the holiest sites in Islam that is going to uh, it's sure going to cause uh, a domino uh, effect on our region well, thank so you ambassador I hope they will join thank you well, you may have seen just, just before we began the plenary session, uh, or just at the beginning of it, uh, Secretary Blinken in the address to HAC 
talked about the Abraham Accords and the very full endorsement from this administration. Uh, Ambassador al Rawai, I wonder if I could ask you to, to jump in on this, on the role that Bahrain expects and wants the United States to continue to play to expand the circle of peace and create success stories out of the peace accords. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, uh, reflecting to uh, this question, is, uh, uh, in Bahrain, we, we are committed to effort to establish regional and uh, international security and stability in cooperation with our allies and international partners. And the United States, as a strategic partner, is at the forefront. The United States, as it always has, plays uh, an important role in maintaining uh, uh, security and stability in the region. So its efforts uh, are a key in, the, in, in regard as we work collectively, as we build on, on historic Abraham Accord to spread the peace, uh, coexistence, and, and uh, prosperity throughout uh, the region. So in this, uh, uh, I believe it's important that the uh, uh, United States and the international community continue to support us as they have done so in the past and they encourage others to, uh, to see the benefits of what uh, we are uh, doing uh, uh, right now. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Naseba, continued U.S. role. What are you expecting? What are you hoping for? So I think I'd like to inject uh, some ambition into the conversation at this point, building on the excitement of everything that has been generated with the initial agreements. The success of these accords depends very much on the work that we put in today and for the coming years. And so it's important to have that sense of ambition for the hope and for the peace circle widening uh, by being pragmatic and practical in selling the peace dividend to wider circle. Uh, we have two or three views on how that needs to be done, and the primary one is continued U.S. engagement. The United States is the preferred partner for this region. Uh, it is a long-standing partner, and we're grateful that Secretary Blinken attended the Negev summit, for example, and has continued to follow up in this administration full support uh, for the Abraham Accords. There are now several working groups in a number of sectors that are following a concrete practical impacts and benefits for the region. And that leads me to my second point. The peace dividend is sold if the tangible practical benefits that we see in the UAE, that we see in Morocco, that we see in Bahrain, and that we see in Israel are felt by a wider circle of Arab and Muslim countries. And these include countries you have peace agreements with, like Jordan and Israel, but there's more work that can be done there. For example, the Clean Energy for Water project that we're working on trilaterally is a very exciting collaboration of bringing capacity electricity to Israel, clean water to Jordan, uh, and facilitated by the UAE's renewable energy uh, industry. So that's one exciting project. The other is, of course, other Arabs in the region, the Egyptians, uh, the Palestinians. These all must be mu much more of the conversation going forward in order to see the tangible benefits of this peace and share the benefit of that peace dividend. So in the initial signing of the Abraham Accords, of course, as you know, annexation, settlements, these were very much part of the conversation because we genuinely believe that the region can only truly live in peace when we've settled all of these uh, historic conflicts. And that's a belief in the UAE, and we'll do our best to work uh, towards that in whatever way we can. And the third thing is the is youth in the region and the economic impact for youth in the region. We have to focus on this group. Uh, and all of our youth share a similar aspiration. They all want to grow up in a peaceful region where their identities, their religious identities, their ethnic identities uh, are accepted wherever they travel. And why shouldn't that be the case? So impacting this demographic, 60% of the wider region, this youth demographic, is going to be the number one challenge for governments across the region today. There was a, I'll leave you with the figures of a RAND study just last year that showed that if we widened the circle of peace, we could add another trillion dollars into the regional economy over the next decade. We could create hundreds of thousands of new jobs for these aspiring youth, and we would take them away from the sadly appealing path of extremism uh, and terrorism if we offered that opportunity. So for me, that is a number one priority, and that is a number one priority for my country. Thank you. Ambassador Hillel, 
What are you expecting from the United States? What have you got from the United States? What are you hoping for? Being the last to answer, it's very difficult to find somebody (laughs) else to say. (laughs) But let me just add that. uh, We believe that, first of all, that uh, this trilateral agreement or Abraham agreement uh, is not an end in itself. uh, We believe that it's a trigger for better uh, Middle East. And it should not uh, remain uh, Morocco, Israel, uh, Israel, uh, yeah, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Bahrain. And it should have another dimension to be more global yeah. and to have a global vision about peace, about security, mm-hmm. about development, about uh, transfer of technology, about investing altogether. Why I'm saying this? Because any peace agreement, if it doesn't have its impact on the people, it will not be ownership by the population. And our people believe in peace. They believe in coexistence. They believe in cooperation with Israel. And uh, there is a real enthusiasm uh, toward uh, tri- making trip to Israel, discovering and receiving also Israelis. We had this tradition of receiving Jewish people without any problem. But going to Israel is something else. And we are very happy that is it's done. But besides the tourism, we need something else, a, a real economic dimension to uh, build uh, something else and to give uh, hopes to the young people. You know that uh, the demography is a problem in our region, yeah. but education also. Offering uh, possibility for people going to study in uh, the, the region that have uh, sign this agreement, and as I, as I said, it should not be, uh, also it should not remain as bilateral agreements just to say we have nothing with Israel. No, we have a lot to build with Israel, but also with Emirates, with Bahrain, with United States, and we need more a uh, proactive role of United States to enlarge, as it has been said, uh, the the agreement to other Arab countries. And it's very possible because expectations and all the studies that have been done up to now are giving very positive signals about the engagement and commitment or, or the hopes of these people joining the, the, the Abraham Agreement and also facing together our challenges of security, of uh, uh, terrorism, violent extremism, countries who are supporting uh, or uh, destabilizing our region. It should not be, for example, country in, in, uh, in the Middle East, like, for example, Emirates or Bahrain. We are facing another country alone. They should be a real a common spirit to work together, thanks to this Abraham Agreement, to face all together these challenges, because that's the only way to uh, really uh, concrete that and to, to, to eliminate all kind of trees and uh, uh, I, mean, I mean risk for the security of the, the So patient. let me pick up on that. We have only a couple of minutes left. I really yes. do want to ask each of you in just 30 seconds really to very quickly highlight the challenges that you see facing this prospect of advancing Arab-Israeli peace. What are the, what are the biggest challenges that you are identifying and need to work on together? Quickly, uh, starting with you, Ambassador. The, the peace process in the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Arab world. I think if we the, the, the negotiations restart or resume, that will give another hope. And it will close the door to extremists. Because the main danger is the extremists who are happy that there is nothing moving again. And the people in the region, Israelis and Palestinians, should speak together. Americans can do a lot, and also people who are within this uh, Abraham uh, Agreement, they can also push, they can give uh, confidence, they can uh, uh, bring their support to all kinds of uh, discussions. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Naseba, biggest challenges? 
Two, two quick points. Geopolitical tensions globally, the superpowers are engaged in uh, other matters. And what I think that provides is both challenge but also opportunity. I think our region needs to collectively burden share, work more closely together on our shared strategic object objectives and put forward that vision, asking our partners for what we need when we need it, rather than over-reliance on them to dictate the strategy. That would be the first uh, challenge. The second challenge is misinformation, disinformation, and the warp speed of uh, social media, uh, which is clouding political judgment. People are making decisions very quickly based on wrong information. And I see that as a huge challenge in the, in the time coming up. It's why we're working so hard on the education agenda, but also on the coexistence agenda. Uh, the Abraham Family House in Abu Dhabi, which will uh, have a synagogue, a church, and a mosque in the same place is part of that countering the misinformation and disinformation about all of our, our faiths. I'd like to see anti-Semitism in our region fought with equal passion against uh, as Islamophobia and together and collectively, because these are both scourges that we, we face collectively as people. So we need to keep in mind that we, we have to keep our facts and our information clear and clear-sighted and be clear-eyed about those challenges. And while geopolitical tensions are occupying our, our friends and our partners, we have to step forward in the region and try and lead the direction and the strategy of our, of our peoples. Thank you. Ambassador Elroy, if I could just ask you to comment, uh, the challenges that Bahrain faces. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think Jason, the uh, religious harmony and uh, coexistence that has uh, characterized the uh, the Middle East for uh, hundreds of uh, years is under serious threat with the uh, with the rise of uh, terrorism or extreme group that are uh, aided sometimes by state and other times by political instability. So I think uh, these two thing, uh, with these two things or two threats or, or challenges, it's important to enhance our collective effort to face the regional challenges and a threat and maintain you know, stability and security and, and uh, uh, enhancing and strengthening regional and, and international peace. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Erdogan, last word. Yeah, uh, I want to build on my colleagues' uh, answers, but try to expand it. It's true that uh, radicals, they do pose a threat against the future of these accords. But you also asked a, qu a, qu a question about how to expand the accords. And we have to ask ourselves why these radicalization processes are taking place. And the answer is quite clear, Iran. Uh, since Iran signed the deal back in 2014 14, and it got the uh, dividends from the sanctions relief, they invested most of the money to strengthen their terrorist proxies in our region, namely Hezbollah, Hamas, but also the Houthis in Yemen, and they threaten many of us. And that is why the uh, Middle East today is divided to two clear camps. There's the moderate camp, I think, uh, be represented here on this stage, the believe in coexistence, believes in uh, uh, tolerance. And there's another camp, the Iranian camp, with its terrorist armies. They're, they're bigger than terrorist organization that is committed to exporting the Shiite revolution. They want to impose their radical Shiite hegemony uh, on our region, and that is even before I start discussing the nuclearization of Iran. But just imagine if we at the UN, we hear so much of how it is dangerous where a country like Russia, they have nuclear uh, cap capabilities. So just imagine, imagine a radical Ayatollah regime. They are merely weeks from uh, the, uh, acquiring their first nuclear bomb, and the international community doesn't do almost anything. This week, the, uh, uh, the IAEA condemned Iran. Instead of taking the case of Iran immediately to the Security Council, holding them accountable, triggering uh, with the signatories of, signatories of the JCPOA, triggering the uh, snapback mechanism, imposing crippling sanctions together with a credible military threat against the Ayatollah, forcing them, forcing them, like President Roosevelt used to, used to say, speak softly but carry a big stick, forcing them to, to decide between their nuclear ambitions and their survival as a regime. 
we continue to hear only talks and talks. So if you ask me what's the biggest challenge, this is the biggest challenge. And I hope now the international community would wake up and we would see, we will see quite soon the Security Council discussions, not only discussing everything that is happening in Israel, but the real thing that are really threatening the future of the entire world. Thank, Thank you. you. This is, um, this is obviously a conversation that could go on for two or three more hours, but unfortunately we are way out of time. But thank you so much, ambassadors, for taking part in this, for always being accessible to AJC. We'll see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've, uh, you've just witnessed um, firsthand the historic changes that are taking place in the Middle East. And more and more, Israel is being accepted and for the first time warmly embraced as a neighbor, as a strategic partner, as a friend. This did not happen by accident. AJC has been laying the foundation for what we just saw for more than 25 years. David Harris identified this transformative opportunity for the Jewish people and Israel and relentlessly pursued it. It was his vision. And vision is important, but Having a vision is not enough. Exceptional leaders are able to turn a vision into a reality, and that is what David has done. Given what we have just heard about breakthroughs for peace between Israel and majority Muslim states, I can think of no better time to announce that in honor of AJC's CEO, we have received a gift of $3 million dollars to establish the David Harris Fund to advance understanding, friendship, and cooperation between Israel and the Muslim world. What, what an incredible and fitting gift in honor of David, who has spent a lifetime expanding Israel's circle of friends. I know that many in this room have known David for decades. You have been an essential part of bringing Israel and her neighbors closer together. Should you wish to make a gift to the David Harris Fund to advance understanding, friendship, and cooperation between Israel and the Muslim world, please email davidfund at ajc.org. That's David Fund, no punctuation, davidfund at ajc.org. We ask that any gift made to the David Harris Fund be of $25,000 or more. Thank you, and thank you, David, for your vision and for your leadership. And now, I am pleased to introduce our next segment, a video address from Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs and alternate Prime Minister, Yair Lapid. Dear friends, it's good to be with you. I recently had a long conversation with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kulbe. And it went against protocol and became a very personal conversation. He was in bad spirits. He told me I hardly made it to the phone call today and I asked why and he told me because there was a siren in Kiev. They moved me to a shelter and I was not sure there would be a phone line for us to speak on. For a moment there was silence. Then I told him, Dimitro, a year ago, in May 2000, 2021, I was in a shelter. Hamas shot missiles at Tel Aviv and they exploded over my, above my home. I sat with my kids in the shelter and we asked ourselves, when will this end? And exactly a year ago, I told him, you sat in a cafe in Kiev and said to yourself, all those people in the Middle East are crazy. They are wasting their lives on unnecessary wars. I prayed to God that next year, not me, not Dimitro, not anyone, anywhere, will have to sit in a shelter with their kids. But prayers are not enough. We have to do something. This past year has reminded us that the biggest struggle in our world is not complicated. It is simple. There is a struggle between good and evil, between terror and violence on one side and freedom and democracy on the other. Many thought this battle was over, that democracy was a given 
and the only moral questions which remained for us to address were those of race and gender, economy and society. And then we received a painful and violent reminder that sometimes there is no choice. If we want to the democratic values we believe in to exist, we have to protect them. And sometimes we have to use force to protect them. Israel has dealt with all of this from all of its 74 years with the help of close friends like you. Our great achievement is that even under constant assault of terror and hatred, of ancient anti-Semitism disguised as new criticism, we maintain our values. Relentless terror, the Iranian threat, missiles fired at our homes, they never caused us to give up on freedom of expression, the rule of law, our democracy, or on liberal values of freedom of religion and defending minority rights. In difficult times, democracy always seems like a privilege. Facing an external threat, it is always tempting to put our values aside until the danger passes. That the important thing is to defend ourselves at any price. That is a dangerous mistake. Because if you put your values aside once, you will not be able to go back on them, to them. Values and principles are not meant for easy times, but to be our compass in the hardest of times. What protects Israel from our enemies and has made us a military technology and cultural success story are our values our ability to maintain a moral code and our democracy under any condition. And I know you share those values and you fight for them alongside us. Today, I want to recognize two champions of those values. The first, my friend, David Harris. Few leaders have had David's impact as an advocate and visionary and Israel and the Jewish people are better off because of your years of dedicated leadership. David, on behalf of the people of Israel, thank you. The second is a close personal friend and partner, AGC's incoming CEO, my friend Ted Deutsch. Genuine friendships are rare in politics, but Ted is a genuine friend. It is a friendship forged around our shared values, ideals, and commitment to Israel and the Jewish people. I am confident that under his leadership, AGC will continue to be driving force in the Jewish world. I look forward to working with him. My friends, our new government in Israel is concluding its first year. This is not just a government, but an exciting political experiment which says we believe that even people who do not agree can work together for the common good. And more than that, we believe that our greatest test is not reaching agreements, but managing disagreements. I am not live, willing to live in a country in which families are torn apart because of politics, a country in which I have no friends who think differently. There are many in our government who think differently than me. They are my friends and partner. We do not put our, ide our ideas aside, but rather we fight for them with the understanding that we have a common goal that is bigger than ourselves. This goal includes you. It includes the diaspora. We, are, we were a globalized nation long before everyone invented the inter interconnected world. Every Jew in the world is connected with one another and therefore every Jew stands in solidarity with one another. Sometimes I discuss this with my non-Jewish friends. It makes them curious. They want to understand our connection. And I tell them, I have three kids and I have to confess, I love my children more than yours. Does this, that make me a bad person? They tell me no. It is the same thing I, t I tell them. Jews around the world, some of whom I have never met, are my family. I do not hate other families, but I love mine more. 
Judaism became, be, began its journey through the creation of a covenant between Abraham and God. It exists to this day thanks to the covenant between us, between all of the world's Jews. This covenant is based on our shared story. More than we are the sons of daughters of a genetic stoke, we are the sons of daughters of one story, the story of a journey towards a world in which we live together. We can live far, live far from another, one another, but we are always on our way to one another. I wanted to speak with you today in order to reaffirm the government of Israel's commitment to you, American Jews. The commitment is simple. You are my family. I love you. Thank you for listening. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.